Okay. All righty. <coughs> well, welcome to uh, Rude Awakening, episode four. Um, we had talked earlier about how numerous mythologies throughout um, the world all seem to be pointing to the same thing, and that's the uh, cataclysmic cycle that uh, we've been talking about. And uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the uh, Hopi Nation and their mythology, uh, their emergence story. And in it, you're going to find they're talking about the same thing as uh, what we had been talking about before. And it's really quite fascinating. In fact, I think it's been, what, two weeks since the last episode? I think so. Yeah, and the more more I get into uh, the uh, Hopi mythology, the more excited I get because I find that it ties in to so many different cultures around the world. So, um, let's just get right into it. We had talked about um, the cataclysmic cycle with Plato, Mother Shipton. Um, I've also got developed a bunch of information on uh, Chinese, Egyptian, Babylonian, Akkadian, uh, Sumerian uh, cultures as well, Vedic, and they again they all seem to be pointing to the same thing. In the Hopi story, we're going to find uh, quite a few similarities. Now, in the Hopi story, this is taken from the Book of the Hopi. Um, I'll give you a link or. Uh, show you who the author of that was <clears throat> but it talks about from the very beginning before um, the uh, world even existed and it says that there was no such thing as the material world at the very beginning it was just something that was in the mind of the creator Teowa. Uh there was no light no matter no time and no life and so he decided that he would put together a plan. The first thing that he did was create his nephew, Sotuknong. And Sotuknong is the one that gathered up all of the uh, materials needed in this voidless space and put them together to create the first world. And he, not only this first world, the Earth, but there was eight other universes or eight other realms. So a total of nine realms. And that's very similar to the nine realms of uh, Nordic tradition as well. And so he placed upon each one of these realms land, water, air, all things that were made uh, of matter. And when he was done with that, he decided that he also wanted a co-creator and he uh, created uh, Spider Woman. And Spider Woman is the one that created all life upon this realm, the first world, uh, which was called Tokpela, which means endless space. And it's called that because from endless space, from a complete void, this world was formed. And so uh, Spider Woman decided that movement was necessary on this world, Earth. And so she created the two twins. The two twins also were very important. They were stationed at one at the North Pole and one at the South Pole. And they were the ones that were responsible for the rotation of the Earth. Um, the first twin is the one that regulated the uh, structure and the movement of the Earth. And the second twin is the one that was responsible for all the air, the wind, all the vibrational centers in the earth. Um, it's something that you may have researched before, uh, ley lines and uh, again, different vibrational places on the earth. And it's very reminiscent of what Nikola Tesla uh, said, probably one of his most famous quotes. He said, if you want to know the secret of the universe, you need to think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibrations. This is probably what uh, the twins were doing. So again, after all these things um, were done, uh, they asked Teowa to 
come and take a look at this world that was created under his direction, under his plan. And he said that it was good. And so the only thing that was left, he says, it is ready now for human life, the final touch to complete my plan. And so that's what Spider-Woman does. Remember, she's the one that's responsible for creating life. And she took the four colors of mankind uh, from the earth, red, white, black, and uh, yellow, and formed them into the four races of man. And then having placed her uh, cape over them and singing over them the song of creation, uh, they came to life. And then she stationed them throughout the, throughout the uh, world. <clears throat> and then she says an interesting thing. She tells them the first time they come to life, she stands them facing the sun. And she says, that is the sun. You are meeting your father, the creator, for the first time. You must always remember and observe these three phases of your creation, the three times of lights, the dark purple, the yellow, the red, reveal in turn the mystery, the breath of life, and the warmth of love. These comprise the Creator's plan of life for you, as sung over you in the Song of Creation. So I find it interesting that uh, she told them right from the very beginning, the Son is your Creator. More accurately, it was the sun would act like a window that the Creator could look down upon uh, His creation. And so the sun was very important to them. Uh, right after that, she gave them uh, languages according to their uh, differences and their race. And so after that, they began to multiply and go throughout the entire earth. But remember, the one thing she told them that they needed to do was they needed to remember their Creator. And as it goes, they did not. <laughs> they got preoccupied, and uh, because of that, the, uh, the uh, Creator Tewa and uh, so, so Tuknang decided that this world needed to be destroyed. Mankind needed to go back to the beginning, start over again, and hopefully learn their, their lesson on uh, the second world. And so that's what's happened. Uh, so Taknong went to the ant people that lived underground and asked them, can you take care of these few humans that were left over? Um, because they're pure in heart. They continue to remember their creator. Uh, very few compared to the uh, population at the time. And so the ant people brought them in, took care of them as the world was changing. Uh, by fire, uh, the first world was destroyed. And then after that, so Tuknong went back and said, okay, come on out. And so that's what they did. They came out on out. But when they came out, they realized that the world had completely changed. It was destroyed by fire, but even the landscape was completely changed. Um, they didn't recognize anything. So uh, they were given a second chance. <clears throat> and as it turns out, as they went through and multiplied and uh, continued on with uh, uh, populating the earth again, uh, being caretakers of earth, they forgot their creator again. They caught up, got caught up in uh, uh, the physical things rather than um, continuing to look to, to their creator. And so because of that, it came time once more that the earth had to be destroyed. So are you following what's going on? There is a cyclical destruction of the earth. And each time, just a few are uh, held safe to re-emerge into the next one. Well, the second world was destroyed by ice. And again, go back to the previous episodes. Remember, we talked about <clears throat> during the polar shift or the polar rotation, 
that depending on what side was facing the sun would determine how it was destroyed. If you were facing the sun, everything would burn up. On the other side, because of oil's law, um, the opposite would happen. It, everything would freeze. Um, all the oceans would boil. That would go up in the atmosphere. It would travel because of the solar winds to the other side of the, uh, the earth. Instantaneously turned into uh, glaciation. And that's the reason we, we even began this on the very first episode of why there's millions and millions of animals found in those glaciers even to this day. So again, the second world had to be destroyed. And so, so Tuknong went to the ant people again um, who were living underground and said, could you please take these people underground because they're pure in heart. And so <clears throat> the world was destroyed again. Um, when they came back out, when they emerged once again, they it was the same thing. The landscape was completely different. Everything had changed. And again, if you go back to, uh, I think it was episode two, the tectonic plates. Mm -hmm. I think it was ex episode two. And yep. because of the massive energy that would take place from a polar shift or re reversal, the uh, sun novaing would have a dramatic effect on the landscape of the earth. So they come out into the third world. Well, <clears throat> did they learn their lesson? No. And in fact, <laughs> it got worse. <laughs> in fact, it got so worse that even though so Tuknong repeatedly says there's a thread to these worlds, there's a beginning and there's an end, again, it's a cyclical basis, this one had to be cut short. Because things were so bad, there was no way that those that were pure in heart would uh, either make it to the place that Sotugnong had prepared for them on the other side of the earth, at, or because of all the destruction that was going on at the hands of man, it was unsafe for them to travel to that. And so this time what he did is he went to Spider Woman and he asked her to take hollow reeds put the humans in it, seal it up, because this world's gonna be destroyed by flood. So uh, that's what she did, and the people were in the reeds, and they felt the massive waves that they were floating upon, and then finally, after a long time, um, they could feel that there was no wave motion. And then finally, there was no motion at all, meaning that they had landed on uh, dry land. So the third world was destroyed by flood. And the people came out and uh, into the fourth world, which is the one the Hopi say we're living in right now. And uh, they emerged once again. And each time that they emerged, they were told to do one thing. Remember their creator. Now in the fourth world, a second thing was added. And that was Take care of your fellow man and remember your creator. Um, by doing this, they would be fulfilling the plan of the creator, Tewa. So they emerged and uh, they were then sent on a quest to wander to the uh, four corners of the earth or the uh, continents that they were on. And because North and South America are connected, they traveled all up and down North America and South America for many, many years. Sometimes they would stop and they would build um, villages. And uh, hopefully we have some footage of uh, one of those villages. But you'll see that when they stopped each time, they had plenty of time to build farms and build villages, but it came time eventually to where they were told that uh, they had to pick up and continue on in their migration. And all this while that it went on, they finally all met up at uh, what they called the center of the earth, which is where they're at today. And the first, second, and third mesas um, in uh, the Southwest. So, 
again, the point was is that they were supposed to um, take care of one another and to remember uh, their creator. And to this day, they're still doing that in their ceremonies and uh, their songs, uh, in their artwork. It's all very reminiscent of uh, the history that they had throughout those four worlds. And then when this world comes to an end, if you ever had a chance to look up the Hopi prophecy, uh, it is said that when this world ends, those ceremonies will come to an end. What happens after that? Um, I personally don't know. Another interesting thing that I found about uh, each one of these four worlds. <clears throat> in the book of the Hopi, and this is according to the tradition of the Hopis, it was uh, sanctioned by 30 Hopi elders uh, to take their oral tradition and finally put it down into uh, a book form. Fascinating book. It's almost 400 pages. I was so impressed by it. I read it in two days. <laughs> so, um, but one very interesting thing that I found in that which lends weight to what we're talking about with the uh, catastrophic cycle and the polar shift. The first world's direction was west. The second one was south. The third one was east. And ours, our earth tilts north. So, by going to that ancient mythology, it seems that the earth shifts. It doesn't necessarily stop and then start rotating the other direction. It can actually turn. In fact, one of the destructions, I believe is the first world, I have to go back and check. Um, it says that the twins, remember one was at the North Pole and one was at the South, they left their station that was what they were told to do. And the earth just went crazy on its axis and flipped over twice. This is actually recorded in both the oral tradition and the uh, Book of the Hopi. So again, we're talking about massive changes. Each time that they came out, they emerged. The landscape was totally different. Now, um, uh, Tommy has been reading up on it as well. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I kind of had into uh, this. <coughs> yeah, I needed to add one yep. of those. But uh <coughs> what we're looking at right here. Um, well yeah, the Hopi word for ant is also Anu. Fucking camera's over there, that's okay. Uh and the Hopi root word Naki means friends. So Anunnaki means ant friends. Ant Friends. Yeah, that yeah. Anunnaki means that. So the Sumerian Anunnaki, were they also Hopi? Mm hmm. I thought that was really interesting within reading it. Yeah, and like I said, the um, Hopi mythology ties into so many different uh, mythologies around the world and traditions. I mean, uh, what you were just reading there, remember, too, that. Uh, in uh, Hopi ceremonies, the uh, kivi, kivas, uh, the huts that they use in those ceremonies, ki means ant hill, va means dwelling. I find that very, very interesting. Yeah, that is the Sanskrit. Uh huh. In Sanskrit, right? Um, which is Vedic. Right. And then uh, the other thing I find very interesting is that the Hopi have the uh, four centers, uh, the top of the head, the, uh, the forehead, the throat, and the heart, um, and that you have to pay attention to all of them. Top of the head is how you, um, how you communicate with your creator. But that's the four, the first four chakras of uh, Vedic and Buddhist um, Meditation. The penal gland. As well, yeah. And um, I, th I find that absolutely fa fascinating. Another thing that I found when I was going through that, <clears throat> remember the third world, the destruction was so bad at the hand of man that the timeline had to be cut short, according to uh, Sotuknam. 
And uh, one of the things that the uh, men on earth were doing at the time is it says that they had leather shields that could fly. And they were so big that uh, you could get a number of people on these sh shields and they could instantaneously fly to one city or one country, it says both, and fly back so fast that the people who were attacked um, didn't even know where they came from. So wow. that's very reminiscent of um, the uh, Vimanyas in Vedic tradition. According to the uh, ancient text, the uh, Ramayana, it said that they had this technology. It says, the aerial and excellent Vim Vimanya going everywhere at will, that chariot resembling a bright cloud in the sky, and the King Rama got in in the excellent chariot at the command of Rakira, rose up into the higher atmospheres. Now this is something that is not only written about, but they, they have all kinds of pictures of what they looked like. Right. It was basically, they said there was um, vehicles that were as big as a palace that could fly through the air. Spaceships. Yeah, spaceships. Exactly. By the way, that's a creepy little pedophile alien there. I know. Yeah, Ashley, like, Ashley drew that one. Did he? It's like, hmm. Hmm, <laughs> what are you looking at? <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, I, find, I find it fascinating that there are so many threads here in the Hopi mythology that fits right in with all these other mythologies. And we start right from the very beginning, you know, right from the very first episode. We were saying that is why we're doing this. Because it seems like all mythologies and all sciences are pointing to the same thing. Remember, at the end of each video, you should be able to answer the three basic questions. Where did we come from? We came from a previous civilization. Where are we going? We're going to give birth to the next civilization. And what's the meaning of life? Well, obviously, from the Hopi mythology, it's the survival of life. That's the one thing that was continuous throughout it. They went to great lengths to save some people to give birth to that next civilization. Right, exactly. And who are the, the guys that would uh, make sure they got food and feed them? The... Uh, the ant people. Yeah, so what? Yeah. The Anunnaki. Right. So they starved themselves to make sure that yeah. they were fed, right? Yeah, the humans were more important than they were to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy. And it, it also connects with Orion's belt, right? Yes. Yeah. The ant people directly relates to Orion's belt according to uh, the oral tradition. But there's others, too, that you need to remember is the uh, Kachinas. Yeah, the Kachinas. Okay, uh, which are the star people. And the Kachinas, I mean, there's, there's numerous Kachinas, but the main ones are the star people. And remember we said that in each of the creation mythologies um, that I've come across, and I've, I've read a lot of them, there's always a benevolent being there to teach the survivors how to survive. Uh, give them instructions, multiply and fill the earth. Um, how to farm, how to uh, raise animals. And um, the, that's who the Kachinas were in the Hopi right. mythology. And, well, at one point, <clears throat> it seems that they had a, uh, a pyramid in either Central or, or South America called the Red City. And uh, to this day, I don't even think the Hopis know where the Red City is. Charles! Yeah. That's where, a, where's the, where's it at? <laughs> <laughs> but the Red City was basically a learning, pe uh, learning place um, run by the Kachinas. And the Kachinas um, would even teach them uh, about the solar system and so that and how to be at, at one with the universe 
and so forth. Well, at some point, the Hopis had to leave uh, the Red City, and the uh, because of uh, danger that was coming. And the Kachinas told them, "It's not yet our time to go, but we can't go with you." And so they, you know, protected them and sent them along their way. But if I remember correctly, and Charles, don't get mad at me. <laughs> But I believe the Kachinas are tied in with the Pleiades. Um, that's where they came from. Hmm. Okay, so now you're talking about two different kinds of alien civilizations, according to the Hopi mythology. Huh. So, and then you go back to the Anunnaki, uh, the Ant people, and we know they're talked about. Oh, yeah. All over the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Totally. It's aliens here. See? <laughs> it's all about the aliens. <clears throat> so I, I found the book of Hopi, book of the Hopi, just absolutely fascinating. You cannot understand the history of this, of this country, especially the Southwest, without reading that book. I mean, I, you you hear things in school, you're taught things, you know, all your life, but ain't nothing compared to what the Hopis can teach us. In a remote time, Spider Grandmother thought outward into space. She thought and breathed and sang and spun the world into existence. So threads and stories, spinning in spirals, all began with Spider Grandmother. To the Hopi, life is part of an infinite pattern a continuum of cycles within cycles. The spinning of the planets reflects the cycle of the seasons, and the circular journey of human life mirrors this larger pattern. The Hopi believe they emerged from below into this world after three prior worlds had begun and ended. This is the story of their fourth world. Mankind, by their own corruption and greed, brought the world to a terrible mess in, in a world before this one. And uh, out of this grew some very sincere and honest men who sat down and meditated and eventually, uh, by meditation, sensed that there was another world which could be a better world and to which mankind could go for to, and be saved. And they called upon the world of nature, animals and birds. And each of the clans relate this part of the emergent story in their own way. And with the eagle clan, naturally, it was the eagle that flew into the sky and then they would ask him what he could tell them about the world up there. And so when he landed, the eagle related that he had found life up there. And this is the Hopi story about the emergence. The Hopi look to nature for knowledge to gain a better world, while the Western mind looks to science in the search for a new perspective on life. And I'm sure that Hopis, even though they are awed by technology and the things that it does, they're not necessarily surprised by it. And so 
When I watched that television program in 1969, it was a grand show when the men landed on the moon. 35 degrees. Roger, 1202, we copy it. 700 feet, 21 down, 33 degrees. Tranquility base here, the Eagle has landed. The Eagle has landed. That was the first thing he said. Certainly, any hope you can recognize the cyclical nature of the landing on a moon in terms of finding a new life, a new future for mankind. And that's precisely what happened with the natural eagle when he came across to the fourth world and in that remote day. For more than a thousand years, the Hopi have survived without irrigation on this harsh, dry land. We have a commitment to raise the corn. We committed ourselves to live by that law, and the law is the corn. To the Hopi, the seasonal cycle of corn mirrors the human journey we all share a pattern made visible in their fields. Today, 8 to 10,000 Hopi and their Tewa neighbors live in 12 independent villages perched high above their fields in northeastern Arizona. The Grand Canyon lies to the west, the New Mexico border to the east. Among these villages are the oldest continuously inhabited settlements on the North American continent. Since the Spanish discovered their villages in 1540, the Hopis have resisted religious conversion, but have chosen to use some new tools of technology. In the face of 400 years of European contact and pressure, they have kept their ancient agricultural practices and values. No piece of land belongs to any individual. He gave us permission to use it and to take care of it. So that's why the Hopis don't like fences. Hopis say their people live at the center point of the world and that it is their destiny to be there. They say their space is sacred, multidimensional, a circle orbited by the emerging and descending sun. Hopi Yellow clouds, yellow butterflies, yellow corn, the good things of life for the people. It's always yellow. Oh. 
Hopi corn. That's one kind of Hopi blue. Blue corn, blue butterflies, and blue clouds, the kinds of blue that you see on Katsinas. The third direction is Tatkyak, red. The red corn, the red flowers, the red butterflies, the red clouds. And the fourth is white, which is Hopak. We happen to have in Hopi corn all of these colors. And these are the cardinal directions. The Hopi they go by the positions of the sun on the horizon. That very point there is the time for planting certain seeds. In the morning, I tell up, you say, to watch the sun rises. I keep track of all this here, you know, when certain things happening. And I also put down the, up on the horizon, the line in here, the line up on the eastern horizon. I regard that as a record, you know, what has been done, you know, from day to day, from day to day. It teaches you how to observe and have your mind and heart on your field and watermelons and beans and corn, because that's where our roots is. We are rooted into our corn fields. The Hopi plant where the sandy soil protects moisture below and in the floodplains where the few inches of precious rain flowing from the mesas feed the plants. Farming here is an art, an act of faith. <laughs> The working of the corn is a very sacred thing. Because there's no irrigation, it's conscious preservation of every drop of moisture in the ground. And so when a Hopi farmer comes to plant, he has to push this dry surface away. And eventually he gets down to the moist dirt. And then into this soft place, he puts the seed. The very sacredness of life is corn, and it is this sacredness which keeps the Hopi coming back out to his field, even though, looking at it strictly economically, it seems futile to see Hopis come out and do the work in the, in the way that they do it, when it could be done a lot more efficiently. The planting stick is a magical stick that carries with it all of this knowledge. The corn, when it's placed in Mother Earth, in its womb, is born by emerging out of the ground. And it is treated as a newborn with all the loving care and all of the right attitude and cheerfulness that the person is capable of bringing. I mean, you know, you think that talking to plants was some new idea. The Hopis have always done it.
as the corn grows, one farmer must be singing. It doesn't make any special song, but there must be music along with the growth of the corn. We emerged in this world the same way as the corn emerges. After a while, it gets to the point where the leaves, out of their weight, fall back to the ground as though for support. We lean on Mother Earth for support. On the wings of the wind, the male tassels scatter the pollen. The corn silk catches the pollen to fertilize the plant. Like young maidens, the plants are ready to bear. The girls, they used to go out to the edge of the village after the dance, you know, in the evening. So the girls all sit down in a row, and then when the boys come, they stand behind them, and then they sing songs like serenading them, and they're not allowed to visit with each other any time of the day. The only time they can visit is at night when the girls grind corn. The door is latched and the mother sees that no one comes in. They have the little hole where they can talk to each other. And that's the only way they can visit. If a boy is whispering from outside and the girl doesn't want to talk to him, she doesn't stop grinding. She usually knows when the right one comes, you know. <laughs> and she might stop grinding and talk to him. And of course, um, the first time the mother knows that she isn't grinding, she gets up and goes and investigates and asks her who is the boy. And she'll tell him, and if she doesn't approve, then she said not to talk to him. If it's the boy that she approves of, she lets her visit with him. <laughs> My mother took me to my husband's, you know, parents' house, and I uh, stayed there, and I had to grind corn for three days straight, you know. There's a lot of women that help the bride prepare the cornmeal for the feast. And it's hard work. And a lot of ladies and men would come to the feast. The corn is stacked and stored until needed. 
Then the moist blue corn is ground and mounded in bowls, pottery jars, and metal tubs. Many Hopi foods are made with blue cornmeal, but piki is special to Hopi. It is a paper-thin bread that Hopis have eaten for a thousand years. When you make piki, you have the blue cornmeal and the ashes. You just put a little bit on it, and that will color the whole batter. This is our bread. When I put my first touch on the stone, it's hot. Yeah, fingers have to get used to it. Making piki is a part of daily life as well as a necessary preparation for a birth, a wedding, or a ceremonial. Women make vast stacks of piki for the wedding feast. <laughs> The wedding preparations continue as the groom's father or clan uncles weave the bridal robes and the bride's mother and family make a special basket for the groom. In her arms, the bride holds the wedding sash. On each side, corn tassels and fringes are symbols of rain and growth. The red dots above the tassel at the base of her gown symbolize the months of blood that nourish the embryo. The red rings and threads encircling the tassels are the veins in the uterus that feed the child. The eagle feathers are a joyful prayer for the child's life on this earth. Here at the lip of conception, the bride wears her shroud, for the bridal robe is her winding cloth, just as the basket her mother makes for the groom will sail him into the clouds at his death. A bride. Like the corn stalk, she carries the capacity for bearing children. She carries the future. The corn plant is like the human body, a body in which life resides. The ears are the children of the stalk, just like children are offspring of men and women. 
Mother corn is a perfect ear of corn which survives the profane world of insects and bugs and crows and turns up with kernels all the way to its end. This corn plays a significant role as the mother as you go from one phase of life to the next phase. When a child is born, it is cared for by its mother and aunts in a darkened room for 20 days. At dawn, the child, protected by a perfect ear of mother corn, is presented to the sun in its naming ceremony. A pinch of fine white cornmeal is put into the baby's mouth. And they say, this is what we eat on this earth. And so you eat that till you have come to the earth to eat this kind of food. That's what they tell the baby. May you live free <laughs> from pain. And may you live long and go to sleep from old age. The Hopi believe that when they die, their last breath, their spirit, becomes a cloud. And the clouds that bring the rain are powerful spirit forces called kachinas. Kachinas become clouds. They travel. They have this power to make life. So the Hopis look to the kachinas for this life blood called rain. Kachinas are the forces of life-giving nature. From winter to the summer solstice, the Kachinas come from their mountain homes to the plazas to dance. Kachinas help the people prepare for the time of planting, a preparation that takes place first in the hearts and minds of the people. Be faithful, keep your thoughts happy, so that your crops will emerge straight and tall. For the Hopi, thoughts and prayers, wishes and feelings, all affect the balance of the world around them. As I paint the Kachina dances, I would hum the, the, that particular Kachina music because that's, you are just involved with all that, you know, the, and you are bound with that and you can't help but sing very, maybe softly as you, as you paint. I got started painting when I was at Santa Fe. And naturally, when you are away from your people, you think about your people. And when there's priests there, way up in the mountain, back of Santa Fe, you hear the home Kachina music among the trees. There's just music, you know. and it's the music that inspire you to start painting. The Kachinas, through their ceremonial songs, inspire life here and in the hereafter. They are our future. They are already where we are preparing to go by our faith. When we see the clouds forming, we know that they're coming. But we can't say it's our people that are coming. We say, Kachinas are coming. Oh!
labor and prayer, our sacrifices come to fruition in rain, clouds, corn, growth, life.